Hi, everybody. As he said, my name is Craig Dusselcone, and I'm going to be talking about our paper, Prime and Abort. Uh, this is joint work with David Kohlbrenner, who's actually going to be speaking on next on a different paper, and also Leo Porter and Dean Tolson. In this presentation, we're going to see how a hardware feature shipping in recent Intel processors actually essentially conducts a cache attack for us by giving us a fast hardware callback when certain cache events occur. And this is going to allow us to conduct cache attacks without the use of precise timers. So let's begin by talking about cache attacks. Cache attacks are a well-known class of attacks that has been shown to be able to recover crypto keys, perform key logging, and spy on the plain text of TLS messages. Cache attacks are generally based on timing side channels in processor hardware, specifically in caches. And exploiting these timing side channels generally depends on the accuracy and availability of precise timers, or things we can use as timers, like cycle counters. Unfortunately, from the attacker's perspective, timers are imperfect and can be subject to quite a fair bit of noise. Even worse, major classes of defenses against cache attacks um, specifically target these timers. So they will either intentionally inject noise in reducing the accuracy and or precision of the um, timers, or they will restrict access to them altogether. We demonstrate a cache attack which does not rely on precise timers or even timing side channels of any kind. Instead, our new attack leverages Intel TSX, which is Intel's implementation of hardware transactional memory, in order to create a cache attack that does not rely on timing information at all. The resulting cache attack we call prime and abort. But let's back up a bit and talk about caches themselves. Caches uh, in modern processors hold data that is frequently or recently used um, in order, with the goal of reducing memory access times for that data on subsequent references. However, caches are shared between processes, and some caches are even shared between cores, which introduces timing side channels because any given process can observe differences in its memory access times depending on what other processes have done in the recent past, specifically what data they've accessed. Caches are made up of cache lines, which are fixed size units of data. In recent Intel processors, which is what we'll be focusing on in this talk, a cache line is 64 bytes of data. Cache lines are stored in cache sets, each of which can hold multiple cache lines. And every cache line is assigned to exactly one specific cache set using something called its set index, which is typically a subset of its address bits. In our example, our cache line's set index indicates that it must go in cache set one. When a new line comes into the cache, some existing line in that line's cache set has to be removed to make room, and this is called eviction. In our example, if a new line comes in needing to be in cache set one, some existing line in cache set one must be evicted. Modern processors have many levels of cache, from the small and fast L1 to the large but comparatively slower L3. Typically, the L3 cache is the only one that is shared across cores, which means that any cross-core cache attack must necessarily target the L3 cache. And finally, in recent Intel processors, the L3 cache is inclusive, which means that any line held in the L1 or L2 cache must also be held in the L3 cache. This property is key to enabling cross-core cache attacks, and basically all of the existing cross-core cache attacks rely on this property of inclusivity. But other than processor caches, the other key hardware feature that is in, uh, leveraged by our new attack, Prime and Abort, is transactional memory. Transactional memory systems offer simpler, optimistic concurrency as opposed to traditional locks. With traditional locks, threads have to wait if even the possibility of conflict exists. For, we'll typically have a critical region that threads will be forced to ex execute one at a time. We might do this if we have a shared data structure. And if multiple threads need to access this data structure, we'll make them do so one at a time just in case they need to access the same element. In contrast, with transactional memory, threads can actually execute critical regions in parallel. And if there are conflicts, conflicts are detected dynamically. For, um, in the event that there is an actual dynamic conflict, for instance, threads needing to access the same element of a shared data structure, then we will get an abort. One or more of the threads will abort, um, which means that basically they will undo everything that has been done in the critical region and then either restart the critical region or branch to an alternate fallback path. But the key is that this transactional abort or serialization only happens if there is an actual dynamic conflict between threads. <clears throat> 
In order to determine when dynamic conflicts exist, transactional memory systems have to keep track of the read set and write set of ongoing transactions. The read set is simply the set of data that has been read by the transaction, and the write set is a set of data that has been written to by the transaction. This tracking can be done in either software or in hardware, but in particular, Intel has done it in hardware in recent CPUs, and the result is called Intel TSX, or Intel Transactional Synchronization Extensions. This is a hardware implementation of a transactional memory system. Despite being relatively new, Intel TSX is already widely available in recent processors. In particular, since 2014, uh, when Broadmoor was released, 100% of Intel server CPUs and a majority of Intel Core i7 and Core i5 CPUs support TSX. This means that our attack is already widely applicable against both server-grade and consumer-grade platforms. But let's talk about how we can utilize TSX inside um, a security context. So here we have an outline of how a TSX transaction looks in assembly code. Xbegin and Xend are new explicit x86 instructions which begin and end a transaction respectively. Xbegin takes a single argument which indicates where the control flow should go in the event that the transaction needs to abort. Arbitrary code is allowed both inside the transaction and inside the user-defined abort handler. Every transaction is guaranteed to either complete, in which case all of its memory changes become visible atomically to other processes in course, or at some point during the transaction or at its end, the transaction will abort, in which case all of the changes it has made to memory and registers and et cetera are discarded, the architectural state is rolled back to before the transaction began, and control is transferred to the user-specified fallback routine or abort handler. We're interested in why and when transactions might abort. There are actually a lot of reasons. One is if inside the transaction we use certain instructions, like Intel's new X-abort instruction. Transactions will also abort if we try to do system calls, if we get OS interrupts, if we try to nest transactions too deeply, if we encounter access violations and page faults, or if there are dynamic memory conflicts. Cause number six, dynamic memory conflicts, is essentially the reason for TSX's existence. It's how we track conflicts between threads. And importantly, these conflicts are detected even if the other thread is not using TSX or doesn't even know that TSX exists. And as an aside, this will be true of all the attacks we introduced today as well. They will work regardless of whether our victims are using or even know about TSX. Intel TSX is a hardware transactional memory system which means that it has to track read sets and write sets in hardware, and Intel has chosen to do this in the cache. This has a couple of consequences. One is that these dynamic memory conflicts are detected at cache line granularity. Another is that cache lines that are part of the read set or write set of a transaction must stay in the cache for the duration of the transaction. In particular, cache lines that are part of the write set of an ongoing transaction have to stay in the L1 cache. If they're evicted from the L1, the transaction will abort. And likewise, cache lines that are part of the read set of an ongoing transaction have to stay in at least the L3 cache. If they're evicted from the L3 cache, the transaction will abort. Causes number five and six enable interesting attacks in their own right. There's some excellent previous work by Jang et al., which describes how to use cause number five, access violations and page faults, to break kernel ASLR. And in our own paper, we, discuss, we discuss an attack based on cause number six, dynamic memory conflicts. However, in this presentation, we're going to focus on our new attacks based on causes seven and eight, oh, cache line evictions. We're going to see that if we can specially construct transactions, the ability, this ability to detect cache line evictions will essentially allow us to build a cache attack along the likes of Prime and Probe, except without the use of precise timers. But before we talk about how we can use TSX in a cache attack, we should talk about the structure of a cache attack. Basically, all cache attacks have this basic structure, where first we have the pre-attack, where we set up for the attack, then we have the active attack, and then finally we have the analysis, where we take the information we gleaned and turn it into something useful, like cryptographic keys. There are two major families of cache attacks that exist today, prime and probe and flush and reload. Of the two, flush and reload attacks are dependent on shared memory, which means that their victims either have to already be in shared memory, such as a shared library, or we need a shared memory exploit as part of the setup for the attack. Um, we discussed flush and reload a lot more in our paper, 
but for this presentation, we're going to focus on prime and probe attacks, and also our new attack, prime and abort. Prime and abort is based on prime and probe. You could even say it's in the prime and probe family, as the two attacks share a lot of structural similarities. And furthermore, neither of these attacks requires shared memory, which makes this a fair comparison. So let's look at how each of these attacks work from a technical perspective, starting with the existing attack, prime and probe. Prime and probe's pre-attack portion has two objectives. First, we need a timing threshold, which is a threshold such that times above the threshold indicate cache misses, and times below the threshold indicate cache hits. We also need an eviction set, which is a group of addresses that completely fill a cache set. The active attack begins with a phase called prime, where we simply access all of the addresses in our eviction set. This completely fills the cache set with our own data. Then we sit and wait. At some point, some other process, which we'll call the victim, may come along and access something that belongs in our targeted cache set. This will necessarily evict some of our data. Later, we'll come back and do a probe step, which is the same as a prime step, except that we'll carefully time how long it takes. So we'll start a timer and access all the same data that we did in the prime step. If there was no victim access, this will go very quickly because we'll get all cache hits. However, if there was a victim access, as shown in this example, then the process will take a lot longer because the memory system has to go find our old data and put it back in the cache. Therefore, we can know that a victim access occurred based on the time being longer than our threshold. Now let's compare this to prime and abort. With prime and abort, we still need an eviction set, but we do not need a timing threshold because we won't be using timing information at all. The active attack begins very similarly to prime and probe, except that first we will open a TSX transaction. This has the effect that all of the lines in our prime step, that is, all of the lines in our targeted cache set, will be part of either the read set or write set of our ongoing transaction, depending on whether we did reads or writes in the prime phase. Then, like prime and probe, we sit and wait. However, as soon as the victim comes along and accesses something in our cache set, this will evict one of our lines, which will immediately cause the transaction to abort because of causes 7 or 8 on the previous slide. As soon as the control flow hits our abort handler, we will instantly know that a victim access has occurred. And this means that the transactional abort mechanism is actually acting as a fast hardware callback telling us when the victim has accessed our targeted cache set. Once the transaction aborts, we can go back, start a new transaction, reprime our targeted cache set, and begin waiting for the next victim access. I want to note that not only were we able to cut our waiting phase short when the victim access occurred, but we are also able to extend our waiting phase essentially indefinitely, waiting for a victim access to occur. We don't have to keep continuously probing our cache set over and over um, like we do with prime and probe. And this is actually why we call our attack prime and abort, because the abort replaces the probe step. Now that we've seen how each of these attacks works from a technical perspective, let's compare their strengths and weaknesses from a security perspective. We've already seen that neither of these attacks requires shared memory. This is in contrast with other attack, cache attacks like the flush and reload family. One disadvantage of both attacks is that they do not precisely target a specific memory address but instead they catch any access to any address that belongs in their targeted cache set. This is another contrast with attacks like flush and reload. However, the ability to precisely target a specific memory address requires that we have shared memory. We've mentioned many times that prime and abort works without precise timers. We also just described how prime and abort does not require a predetermined length waiting phase. With prime and probe, we have to choose the length of the waiting phase ahead of time, and with some implementations, this can turn into an accuracy versus resolution trade-off. With prime and abort, we don't have to worry about that at all. One advantage of prime and probe is that it can monitor multiple cache sets at once and distinguish accesses between these cache sets. With prime and abort, we have restrictions. So we can monitor multiple cache sets at once, but to do that, we'll either need multiple threads or we will not be able to tell which of our targeted cache sets was accessed when the transaction abort occurs. With prime and probe, at the cost of increased overhead, we can essentially do this. Uh, we can just prime multiple cache sets, do a single waiting phase, and then probe each of them, determining which were and were not accessed. Some existing applications of cache attacks rely on this ability of prime and probe, but many do not. And for the ones that do not, that only require us to monitor like one or two cache sets, they are relatively easy to port over to prime and abort. Prime and abort has a speed advantage over prime and probe 
thanks to the fast hardware callback it receives when there are cache line evictions. It also has an accuracy advantage because the hardware essentially conducts the cache attack for us, telling us when a victim access occurred, rather than making us guess when a victim access occurred based on timing information. One of the key steps in both prime and probe and prime and abort is this pre-attack portion where we generate eviction sets. Again, an eviction set is a group of addresses which exactly fills a cache set. In recent Intel processors, this is much more difficult because of something called complex set addressing. Intel has divided the L3 cache into slices, and it uses an unknown hash function to determine for each cache line which cache slice it should go in. Um, one mechanism for dealing with this is to reverse engineer the hash function, which is proprietary and undocumented information in Intel processors. This has been done for several architectures, and there are actually several papers on this topic in the literature. The problem with this is that the hash function can vary from processor to processor. So our approach instead is to determine eviction sets directly on the fly without needing to know the reverse engineered hash function. We believe that this makes our attack more general. Our algorithm for doing this is derived from Mastic, a publicly available implementation of Prime and Probe and other cache attacks that's thanks to Yuval your Rome. This algorithm, in turn, is based on the Lewidall paper, which was the very first cross-core cross prime and probe attack. We adapted this algorithm to use TSX, which means that not only in the active attack stage, but also in this pre-attack portion, we do not rely on the existence or accuracy of precise timers. It also means that we have a speed and reliability advantage over prime and probe, even in this pre-attack portion. This is an illustration of our speed advantage. This is the runtime to generate a group of complementary eviction sets, one for each cache slice. On our test machine, which is an Intel Skylake Core i7 processor, Prime and Abort is over five times faster than Prime and Probe in the median case. This graph shows the result of an experiment on Prime and Probe. We'll show results on Prime and Abort in a second, uh, where we see how well it does at detecting victim accesses that occur on another core. On one core, we ran prime and probe, and on another core, we ran a simple victim process that just accesses a targeted memory location at various frequencies. The x-axis shows the number of memory accesses per second performed by the victim, and the y-axis shows the number of events per second detected by prime and probe. In the blue, in treatment condition in blue, uh, the victim actually accessed the targeted memory location. However, in the control condition in orange, the victim accessed an unrelated memory location, which allows us to measure false positives. Perfect performance in this graph would be directly along the y equals x line, where we detect all of the victim's memory accesses, but no false positives. We can see that in the treatment condition in blue, Prime and Probe actually does very good at this, detecting almost all of the victim's memory accesses over a wide range of frequencies until it eventually levels off at a top speed, which on our machine, uh, we measured at about 300,000 events per second. Again, in here, the solid line on each of these graphs is the median of all trials, and the shaded area is the approximate range of all of our observations. You can see that both of these axes are actually on a log scale, which means that we have quite a bit of variation um, from trial to trial in the treatment condition at the faster speeds. Almost an order of magnitude difference between trials. And we also observe about 250 false positives per second with Prime and Probe in all of the control conditions. Here I've left on just the median line for the treatment condition from Prime and Probe for comparison with the Prime and Abort results, which are right here. One of the first things you might notice about Prime and Abort is that it's very consistent. The range of observations is very tight around the median line. Prime and Abort is very good at detecting almost all of the victim memory accesses. It also has a top speed of a million events per second which is over three times faster than Prime and Probe. And finally, it observes about 200 false positives per second, which is fewer than Prime and Probe, albeit with more variation from trial to trial. Finally, we applied our attack, Prime and Abort, against OpenSSL's T-table implementation of AES. This is a traditional target for cache attacks, which is no longer used in practice by OpenSSL, specifically because it is a traditional target for cache attacks. However, like a lot of the literature, including many recent papers on cache attacks, we use it as a proof of concept or hello world to show that our attack works on real targets. This is a chosen plain text attack, which leads to full key recovery for the attacker. I will omit the rest of the technical details. You can find them in our paper or in the literature. <laughs> 
But briefly, we expect to see a spike in each of these graphs when our plain text bits match the corresponding key bits. Although um, both attacks clearly indicate the correct key, our attack arguably does so with a better signal and less noise. There are a variety of countermeasures which have been proposed or could be proposed against cache attacks in general or prime and abort in particular. Many of these are discussed more thoroughly in an excellent review by G et al. But let's begin by talking about countermeasures which are going to be ineffective or impractical against prime and abort in particular. Um, first among these are obviously any countermeasures which target timers, either seeking to inject noise to make them less accurate or precise, or by restricting access to them altogether so that user processes have no ability to access precise timers. These countermeasures will have no effect on prime and abort. Disabling TSX is technically possible. Uh, you might remember that Intel actually did this in a number of Haswell CPUs due to a hardware bug. However, TSX is rapidly gaining adoption in the community. It's already used in both the JVM and glibc, which makes this unlikely to be a feasible long-term solution. Monitoring TSX or events or activity is another thing we could do, but the problem is that prime and abort's activity is unlikely to look suspicious. Legitimate benign TSX programs tend to also be heavy users of TSX and generate a lot of transactions and a lot of transactions aborted. So it's unlikely we would be able to easily distinguish prime and abort from benign programs. However, uh, there are a number of uh, approaches which are actually promising and defend against all kinds of cache attacks, including prime and abort. One of these is constant time techniques. In their simplest form, this just means that a function or program executes in the same amount of time regardless of its input. This is not enough to defend against basically any modern cache attack. However, a stricter form of constant time techniques guarantees that no memory access or control flow decision is ever based on uh, secret data. This is completely effective against all kinds of cache attacks because it completely closes off the side channel. We actually believe that constant time techniques are the most promising uh, defense against side channel attacks. Monitoring cache events is another thing that's possible. It's frequently proposed and frequently implemented. It works because cache attacks tend to generate a lot of extra cache misses, especially in their victim processes. We can monitor these cache misses using hardware performance counters and determine when a cache attack is taking place. Um, the problem with this is that these schemes are necessarily imperfect and subject to misclassification errors in both directions. There are some proposals to introduce noise not into timers, but into cache operations themselves. For instance, we could randomize the mapping between cache line and cache set, or we could randomize the cache replacement policy. Either of these things would make it much more difficult to conduct cache attacks. Cache set partitioning proposes that we uh, prevent any one process from using all of the slots in a given cache set. Um, this is, Intel has something called cache allocation technology available in a few of its recent server-grade processors, which goes partly towards implementing this. The problem is that this will hurt single-thread performance, and in particular, it will reduce the maximum size of a TSX transaction. I also want to mention that I'm aware there is a new proposed countermeasure against cache attacks that actually uses Intel TSX itself, and you can hear more about that in this room today at 2.30 p.m. In conclusion, Prime and abort is a high-precision cross-core cache attack which does not rely on the availability or accuracy of precise timers. Instead, it leverages Intel TSX, which is Intel's implementation of hardware transactional memory and is widely available in recent Intel processors, both server and consumer grade. Prime and abort is more efficient and less noisy than Prime and Probe, both in the actual attack and in this pre-attack portion where we generate eviction sets. And finally, it works in practice against T-table AES. Thank you for your time, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Uh, so could you just say a few words on how specific is this to Intel? So how does this apply to AMD or ARM? So um, AMD and ARM do not currently have hardware transactional memory implementations that are part of their processors. So we are exploiting a feature which is currently specific to Intel processors. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just a, another quick question, just a clarification. You said that you, you can only trans you can only track one one uh, cache set. We, this? we can track multiple cache sets, but we either have to use one thread per cache set we're tracking, 
or we'll just not be able to tell which of them was accessed. But why, why, couldn't, why couldn't you nest these, uh, these transactions and then have a different handler for every, every yeah, level of Yeah, so nest? with Intel TSX, the issue is that their implementation, if we have nested transactions, any abort always triggers the outermost transactions ah. abort handler. It's their implementation. Great, thanks. Hi. Um, without knowing anything uh, about how TSX works specifically, um, do you know if uh, this attack would work across VM boundaries? There shouldn't be any reason that it wouldn't work. Um, it, prime and probe attacks have been demonstrated to work across VM boundaries, and for the same reasons, this attack should work across VM boundaries. Since that cache would be shared between VMs, presumably. Yes. I mean, the L3 cache basically has to be shared between VMs. It's very hard to like flush it on every switch or anything. Okay, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that uh, the transaction can uh, remain until aborted. Mm -hmm. uh, would operating system activity cause a, a transaction abort? Yeah, so certainly operating system activity can abort our transaction. We'll certainly abort whenever we have a transition to privileged um, execution. Um, but we're actually able to throw out these aborts because Intel provides us something called an abort status code in the abort handler. So we'll be able to tell whether the abort occurred due to OS activity and then be able to throw those out as obviously not real uh, victim accesses. Hello. Yeah. My question is, if you wait on a wrong cache site, is there an infinite wait? Meaning you're always waiting uh, about, right? So if there is no about, what happened? So this question may be introduced another one. How to decide it, which cache set you should to wait on? So the question is how we decide which cache set to target? Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, th so that depends a lot on the specific attack and what we're attacking and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, there are plenty of existing techniques in the literature that either we have very specific knowledge of our victim's binary where we know where some sensitive code or data is located and want to track accesses to it, or we could even imagine using like machine learning techniques to determine which cache set. Um, just looking at the access, you know, iterate through the entire cache and attack each cache set and look for the one that has the signature you're expecting. Okay. Did I answer the question? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question correctly. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again.